Well, welcome everybody to episode six of Bathica Banter. And I could not be more excited about our guest today. Uh, most of you know him as the former CEO of Hydro Quebec, but his resume is so much more than that. And we'll we'll touch on each one of his steps in his career as we go through our interview today. But could not be more excited and frankly honored to introduce to you Andre Kali. Andre, say hello to everyone. Hello, everyone. I'm pleased <laughs> to meet you all. Andre, Andre uh, I, I have to tell you, it's an absolute honor to have you on our program today. So first of all, thank you so much for, for your most valuable time. Um, My pleasure. Look, um, I, I want to start at the start. And, and, and what I mean by that is, Andre, uh, I always like to go back into our guests past to see what got them on their current path. So I, I understand that as a child, your early years were spent on your family's farm, a, a very modest farm. Can you share with our audience that experience and what you gained in your formative years as a result of that experience on, on the family farm? Yes, I was raised on a modest, uh, modest farm. You're right. Uh, my experience, the, uh, when I think of my youth, uh, my, f the, uh, my first years in life, I see a wonderful place. It was so beautiful, absolutely beautiful. It was mm. the, the, a country, you know, and mm. uh, filled with uh, nice uh, odors and a little bit wind was absolutely, uh, what we would say today, charming. Uh, countryside. Mm. My parents uh, uh, did uh, the uh, they work, of course, uh, both of them worked there. They worked together. They were very much uh, in love with each other. And they mm. talked all day while they work, you know, on different uh, subjects. And uh, one of their first priority was to uh, uh, send us to school. Mm. So we, we went to school. We went to school for our first degree, first six years here in in Canada. And then uh, uh, after that, secondary school. And then I went to college, military college, in, the, in fact. Uh, but uh, what I remember it is it was so beautiful. So mm. beautiful. Yeah. That's, ah, be that's <laughs> a beautiful memory. Yeah. Yes. So... Clearly, Andre, the family far, farm was not your ultimate destiny, uh, as I understand it. And as you just mentioned, a uh, military college would be in your future. And, and I also understand that was not a particularly popular decision with your parents, the, the military college. So please share with us why military college and uh, how did that set you on your path? So, uh, why? It's uh, it's because uh, my father came to me. Uh, I remember it was in a Saturday afternoon uh, uh, to tell me that uh, uh, they, him and my mother, didn't have the money to send me to secondary uh, school or college. Mm. Uh, uh, and therefore that I would have to think about uh, 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 something to do in life that would be uh, sim simple. Uh, well, that would not imply uh, longer studies. So, uh, and by that time, this in the same, not the same week, but the sa let's say the same months, uh, uh, a, an officer from the Canadian Navy came to our school and said that there had there was a program called ROTP, Royal Officer Training Plan, uh, and mm -hmm. that uh, we can go to college and at the same time have uh, an experience in the Navy. Uh, so I decided that, well, uh, this is for me. So I enrolled, uh, I signed in, I, I got in the Navy without my parents knowing. <laughs> and uh, I was not 18 yet. So the Navy wrote to my parents ask him if they agree with my signature and because they were responsible and they would have to agree otherwise they wouldn't go so right. my mother when came uh, dinner uh, uh, said to my father you know what he did uh, uh, today 
Yes, <laughs> of course, father said, no, not, no, I have no idea what he did this so special uh, today. She said, of course, and third, he's, he's, he got into the Navy without telling us. <laughs> 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 so, and, you know, she, it was French Canadian people, right? They only yeah. spoke French and, and so on. So they say, this is not a good thing. He will lose his, that's mother speaking. He right. will lose his religion, his Catholic religion. Mm -hmm. He will mm -hmm. lose his French and so on. It's a terrible, don't you think? Father said, well, maybe, maybe, but I don't see that as terrible as you see it, uh, darling, because uh, after all, he will get to school what he always wanted to, uh, to do with uh, us that don't have uh, money to pay for that. So why don't we let him try at least, let him try. So that's how they, it was decided uh, finally that I would go to uh, CMR, the Collège Militaire Royal uh, de Saint-Jean. And uh, it was a wonderful experience for me, by the way. Uh, yeah. We went abroad when it, twice on the Atlantic, once uh, on the Pacific, went to Hawaii. Uh, I went so far away from home, you know, I could not imagine Earth was that large. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> it was a, a beautiful experience. And every uh, uh, people that looked after us, during these years was just wonderful people. Uh, what, they were wonderful people. They made me uh, first of class and they made all, they also made me one of the good players on the hockey team, which is not something neg neglectable for me. It was very important to be good at sports. And that's how I uh, became uh, the Cassius Squadron CSL, by the way, uh, Cadet wow. Squadron Leader. Uh, everything was good about CMR. Everything was good. Fantastic. Well, I, I just learned something I didn't know, Andre. Uh, <laughs> you you and my father have something in common. He ran away from home at the age of 15 to join the Marines. Oh, yeah. Is that right? <laughs> and, and, of course, at, at 15, you're not old enough to join the Marines, but he lied yeah. about it. Uh, but eventually the, eventually the Marines caught on yeah. and they, they called his father and his mother. And his father said, well, at least we know where he is. <laughs> and they let it yeah. be, but that, yeah. that's yeah. so interesting. Yeah. yeah. Well, look, Andre, I, I will tell you that uh, coming up to our interview today, I, I did quite a bit of research about you and, and, and your, your history. Um, your accomplishments in business and science and government, but I found very little about what I would call your formative years, you know, your childhood and your schooling uh, and such. And mm. I always quite frankly find that to be most interesting, especially about someone of your stature, because I think it's the formative years that form your goals and your ideas and 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 your how you think about business and how you think about the world in general. So this is where I'm going, Andre. Okay, I, okay. I, under, I understand that there was a local gas station owner who used to give you free gasoline so that you could travel to Montreal to study physical chemistry so that you ultimately received your PhD in physical chemistry in 1968. So mm. please share with us the details of that story and and why chemistry? What was it about chemistry that was so appealing to you? Please. Okay, so between Saint-Jean-sur-Richelieu, uh, the place where I was uh, uh, raised, and University of Montreal were about 25 miles. I had to travel back and forward each day. So I bought myself a Volkswagen, a little Volkswagen, and I entered into commerce. I, I, I did a contract for, to carry three other guys from Saint-Jean to the same university each year. 25 cents a trip. That <laughs> it paid for the car and usually for the gasoline as well. Right. But at times, it was not sufficient. Therefore, I stopped at the gas station owned by a good friend of my father and okay. say, Mr. Lagu, I'm sorry, but this morning I'm going to Montreal and I have no 
gasoline in this car. So either you put gasoline in it and I follow my courses at the university or uh, I will talk to you uh, all day. I will stay here in your garage all day. <laughs> he said, he answered, the other might as well fill your car <laughs> for free. You go to university. <laughs> I, I, I won't have to care after you all day. Okay? And, uh, but remember, as you get uh, the instruction and the formation that goes with it, you will promise me before you leave that uh, after that you will work for all of us in Quebec. You will stay in Quebec and work for us. If you can uh, uh, make a contractual arrangement with this, it's okay, I gave you the gas for free. So he did, so I did. I stayed in Quebec, I've worked in Quebec all of my life, although I had opportunities and in fact offers to go abroad, well, but I didn't, I never accepted. Except on a part-time basis, I never worked outside Quebec in Canada. Oh, Andre, mm -hmm. I, that, that's incredible, yeah. so a, a commitment in your university days to a local gas station person who helped you is yes. what kept you in Quebec. Oh, I, I, that's sacred for me, sacred, because this guy, you know, he was so respectable. He was a farmer too. I, he owned a farm near ours. So it would be uh, a high felony if I wouldn't have kept my word. Yep, I, wouldn't, right. I wouldn't consider not at all to do that. It's it's beautiful, Andre. I'm touched by that. I you know not everyone would have held to that word. So it it certainly yeah. speaks to your character as well as his. Yeah. It's it's yeah. It, what a be what a beautiful story. Yeah. Well, 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 Andre. I I want to stay uh, in the time of your life in in the military uh, university. Uh, it's mm. my understanding that you were the first French speaking person to achieve the rank of cadet squadron leader. So my question to you is, what exactly did that rank mean at the time? And how how did getting that rank uh, uh, help your personal self-esteem? Please. Yeah, uh, uh, I was the uh, one of the first of Cat C squadron to be the CSL. Uh, but that was in uh, the first French, uh, was in the, my mother's mind because she had converted to the military college by that time, that was after three years. And she was very proud that I got to be the CSL. Being a C CSL uh, meant that you, you would be the first cadet. Uh, CSL means cadet squadron leader, like mm -hmm. in the Air Force, okay? Uh, because uh, CMR is administ uh, administration is from the Air Force. Uh, uh, the responsibility was uh, responsibility about between 150 and 200 cadets. Uh, the military responsible for the military training, or an important responsibility relative to military training and discipline. Uh, uh, and you had to be responsible for people that were your friends, the cadets that you were on the same grade as you, and mm -hmm. other uh, juniors, of course, the, the junior and the preps. The preps were first year there. There were three years uh, mm -hmm. uh, for a whole cycle. And uh, I enjoyed it very well. I remember the first time I went in the Kari. The Kari was the saloon, a place where we will regroup in, inside the building, inside the mm -hmm. squadron building. And the first time I got there, you know, I had my knees that were shaking and uh, somebody called the room to attention. They said, room attention. And uh, 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 my, uh, my uh, worries went away immediately because when at that attention, all cadets had to look right in front of them. So they were not looking at me. I felt like I could look at them, but they could not look at me. Oh. So they, they didn't see me shaking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very I good. Appreciated that. So some of the stress, most of the stress went away, and I started uh, playing my role. Yeah. Uh, at, at times, you know, even these these years, I think like, for, say, some, to give an example, last year, I went back in the carry walked through the same door 
was not shaking. Well, ah. I have to I have to say there were nobody there or <laughs> close to nobody. <laughs> so, like, but it was okay. I like to go back like this, you know, where I've been so the, uh, 10, uh, 50 years ago. I, I, yeah. I like to do that. And I, I loved everything about the military college, including, of course, uh, the, the uh, cadets, the other cadets, and uh, the, the people that looked after us, the people that were, uh, were they were wonderful. Right. Especially, especially, I have to give you his name, if Please. you will allow me, Please. Lieutenant Please. Commander Arnott. Arnott. He was a keeper, which means somebody was an officer, but he was in, an officer in the Royal Navy in Britain. This chose to come to serve in Canada. So he was a keeper. And that's he, he was responsible for the sports. That he that trained me so that I could put on some, I don't know, I was 140 at the end of the year, was 175, all muscle. Okay, that's, uh, that's lots of work, you know, every night yeah. I to report to, to him and he was giving me specific exercise so that I grow muscle. And uh, by the third year, as I said before, I was on the uh, hockey team, uh, rep uh, hockey team. That's it. Everything went uh, so good. So I've enjoyed those years so much. Oh, it's, 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 it's beautiful. And, you know, there's an old saying, Andre, that you can never go home again, but it sounds like you do. And, 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 and that's, yeah. that's beautiful that you can go home again. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Especially yeah. when the home was as special as what you're describing. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Andre, look, so you held the position of president and chief executive officer at Gas Metropolitan, the natural gas utility company. Yeah. From 1987 to 1996, and and I'm curious, Andre, to know your thoughts on the current movement from natural gas away from natural gas in both the United States and Canada. How do you feel about that as a person who was once so entrenched in the natural gas market? Yeah. Well, uh, climate change is a major, major issue that yeah. um, I agree fully with. So therefore, we have to move away as a society, as a global society, uh, away from fossil fuels uh, when it comes to producing energy. Have to move away from oil, from coal, and from natural gas. But the less uh, uh, contributor to uh, CO2 production among fossil fuels is natural gas. So, so the uh, chemical formula is CH4. So there are four hydrogen for one co carbon. Carbon. When it comes to the uh, oil, it's, uh, it's CH2. Twice as, twice as less hydrogen for one carbon. And when it's coal, of course, it's coal. There's no hydrogen at all. So... Uh, when, as we evol evolve, as we evolve from uh, uh, plenty of fossil fuel fuels, uh, uh, the, the 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 priority is not to get rid of natural gas. The priority is get rid of coal, and then yeah. rid of oil products, and then and then maybe to our, do our best to reduce natural gas. Uh, and that could come in 10 or 20 years. doesn't have to be. In, it's much better to, if you have a dollar to spend, spend it to, in, in, in order to reduce coal consumption. Don't spend it to reduce uh, natural gas consumption because you, you're not doing it uh, as efficient. You, know, you, know, you won't be as efficient as you could be uh, up, up, up and on the optimum scale. Right. Uh, so that's what that's reality, but I think that the, the the speech has gone far now, and uh, we say we're against fossil fuels, whatever it is. Well, it's not very, it's not logical. It's simply not logical. So therefore, it's not optimum, and I cannot support that idea. I'm for using, still using natural gas. Uh, uh, with, no, 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 let's not. Uh, uh, act as if we want to optimize uh, natural gas, uh, hmm. but we can keep natural gas, but focus on coal and uh, oil products. 
That's uh, uh, Andre, recommendation. Something um, jumped out at me about when you first started your answer, and I want to come back to it if you'll allow yes. me. You, you, you mentioned climate change. I, I just want to be clear because someone of your stature, uh, this is important that everyone understand this. You believe climate change is, is real. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Uh, well, here in, in Canada, uh, in Eastern Canada, we have uh, so many evidence like uh, yeah. flooding, like uh, 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 wood fire, uh, forest yeah. fire. And that it that's become obvious that something changes. What is also obvious is that uh, 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 CO2 contributes to the greenhouse gas effect. It's that also is obvious. Is it is there a direct relationship as people say? Maybe not as much as some uh, 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 people, some ecologists uh, do say. But there's a relation. That's for sure. So the less we'll input CO2, uh, the less in, uh, CO2 inputs in the atmosphere, the better we will all be. And we have, strictly have to do something. Yeah. Mm. Uh, uh, another thing that I wanted to uh, go back to, if I may, uh, Andre, is, is natural gas. So out of the fossil fuels, the most common oil and natural gas, natural gas, if I understood you correctly, is uh, the least of the two evils. I, I, I'm, I'm kind of overstating it, but you know yeah. what, I'm, what I'm getting at. Yes, I agree. And, and, yeah. and, and, and I, I, again, if I understand you correctly, uh, you believe in a movement away from the fossil fuels, but we have to do it in a reasonable way. Yeah. We don't. I, I, for the example, New York City, I was born in the Bronx, uh, Andre, and I never thought I would live to see the day where n n natural gas hookups are no longer. You could not have new construction natural gas hook hookups in New York City. I never thought I'd live long enough to, to have to see that. Um, it, it just seems unreasonable to me uh, to just have that definitive cutoff. But uh, I'm I'm. I don't know if you will agree with me, but I, I often find that politicians, there's, it's always black and white. There's no gray area. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they want to decarbonize now. <laughs> you know, they, now, they don't well, recognize, well, they don't recognize that there should be a uh, process. Yeah. You and I know that it won't be immediate. It's, right. There's nothing like uh, something immediate there. So we have to deal with uh, thinking reasonable way, in a reasonable right. way. You know, right. I've learned it's working so many years in the energy sector that, uh, uh, and when I was at WEC, I promoted the idea that in, in the energy sector, we have to think about the three A's. Energy has to be, first of all, available, has to exist in some mm. way. Thinking about things that do not exist won't help anybody. Right. It has to be accessible. That is, sure. that we have to invest in different ways to bring it from where it is to the customer. Right. And thirdly, thirdly, and very important, usually forgotten, it has to be affordable to all people. If right. not affordable, it's useless. So if we can, it's not easy. It's difficult. It's very difficult. Make right. sure that our programs to move away from the fossil fuels uh, creates a situation where energy is available, accessible, and affordable. Right. We get to, yeah. th that's the way to do it. There's no other way. It won't work if we right. try to do uh, otherwise. Well, well, Andre, I think your three A's uh, is a perfect segue into my next question. And uh, so, look, Andre, from reading about you online, uh, I understand uh, from previous in interviews that you've given that uh, uh, you favored the Quebec 1995 referendum on sovereignty. And I'm very, very curious to know your feelings on the current situation in Alberta where Premier Danielle Smith has proposed the Alberta sovereignty within a United Canada Act, which much of its roots are based in energy and the rights of provincial government to determine its own destiny. 
when it comes to federal mandates on energy and specific types of energy. So a long way to get to my question. How do you feel? Uh, how do you feel about this sovereignty act in in Alberta, if you would, which which has such a basis yeah. in energy? You know, Al Alberta's economy is based on oil, fossil fuels, yeah. yeah, which is something that's and the use of those has has been developed on a world scale basis everywhere, everywhere there's oil, okay, and coal and natural gas. While in Quebec, our, our, our resource is hydro power. That is right. a local power. It's, it's local. It's not the same thing. There, immediately, I, I can think, we can think that all Canadians contributed to the development of oil in Alberta. It's not all Canadians. In fact, it's only Quebecers that have contributed to the development of hydro power in Quebec because it's a local source of energy. Uh, uh, not, nobody had to think about it. It's simply the, the pure uh, reality. So therefore, uh, uh, when you are in Alberta, when your economy has been developed from all Canadians being customers, you got to think that uh, you owe something to all others. And that's why the federal government has a responsibility when it comes to oil management of all many all oil programs across the country uh, and while in uh, uh, when it comes to electricity well the, no other canadians have contributed directly to the development of uh, uh, hydropower in quebec so it's not the same reality and poli politics have to consider the succession of generation not only one generation but the succession of generation in order to be fair to everyone. But I didn't vote for the referendum uh, for that because uh, it, it, you have to go back right at the beginning of our exchange. Uh, I, I was raised on a family. Uh, they, they, they were proud people, very mm. proud people, honest, proud, hard workers. Mm. And uh, when it came to the uh, referendums, we voted for because uh, uh, we knew that there would be very hard work after a, a yes vote. We knew that, but we were not afraid of working harder. Right. It was not the decision we, we made, and uh, so be it. I do respect the decision that's been made, and that's it. Yeah. I have very good friends in, in uh, English Canada, very, very good friends. I've been the, the chair of the Canadian Gas uh, Association, so... And I was pushed there by a good friend, uh, Bob Martin, a, 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 who, who were and still is, in my mind, Mr. Gas, Natural Gas in Canada. He was the mm. CEO uh, of the Natural Gas Company in Toronto. And uh, we're, we remain, that's forever, forever. We'll right. remain friends. Yeah. You know, I, I, find the pol I find Canadian politics, Andre, so interesting. I'm I'm here in the states. Yeah. Uh, I always tell people, my Canadian friends, look, I I, I have no horse in the race. It's not going <laughs> to affect my personal life, and that's why yeah. I could be interested in it without being judgmental about it. You know, um, mm. but but I I I do find Premier Daniel Smith in uh, in Alberta so interesting. Just just the name of her act. Uh, Alberta mm. sovereignty within a united Canada. That sounds like, yeah, that sounds, like mm. a contradiction, doesn't it? <laughs> well, man. We had the same in <laughs> French, by the way. Huh? We use, we use, they were saying here, un Québec indépendant dans un Canada fort. Well, a, a strong, <laughs> a, an independent Quebec in a strong Canada. That's what the <laughs> motto. <laughs> so yeah, it's, 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 it's not new. It's not new. It sounds a, a bit passive aggressive. <laughs> exactly. 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 Yeah. <laughs> well, well, look, Andre. I hope you don't mind that I don't keep to a strict chronology order no. of, of your many uh, accomplishments. Uh, I learned in my research leading up to our interview today that you spent some time uh, early in your career in both education and government. Uh, you were a professor, and please excuse my pronunciation here, uh, a, a professor and coordinator at Quebec's Institut National de la Research, something scientific, uh, scientific. until 1974. 
Yes. And then director of Quebec's Environmental Protection Services. And you served as deputy minister of the province's environment department until 1981. So this is my question. I'm wondering how these two experiences, both as an educator and uh, in, in government, how that helped shape you as a business executive ultimately. Yeah. Please. Well, for, for, uh, when I was the deputy minister, and uh, yeah, when I was a deputy minister, uh, I was uh, uh, charged with the responsibility of uh, developing a, a water cleanup program. And uh, we had to do uh, dealings with the municipalities, of course, big big, big uh, treatment plants, and with the industry, with the uh, uh, farmers, and with the industry, especially the large industry. And that during those years, there were 52 of them, mostly along the river, the Saint Lawrence River, but not only along the Saint Lawrence River. Uh, so I had to decide how we would uh, approach uh, these large. Uh, 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 industrial. What I didn't want to do is to uh, affect them so much economically that they would have to close their doors. I didn't want to do that. Not at all. I wanted to clean it up, but not close the, not by closing the doors. So we made specific programs for each one of them, and they were all different, of course, because they were uh, fully adapted to their economic condition. That's how I studied the economy of uh, producing oil. Well, in, in the refi refineries here in the east end of Montreal. But mm. that's how I learned about the pulp and paper uh, industry, the details. How, the, how does it work? Why is it profitable to produce paper to sell to New York so that they can print uh, the uh, uh, New York uh, the, uh, news, uh, uh, daily news and things like yeah. that. Oh, that's yeah. how I got to be exposed for the first time to the economy. The same thing was true, of course, when we came to regulation, regulation of uh, pig farms uh, and, uh, and cows and things like that. So it went from... I studied just about everything in the Quebec economy in order to tailor made our program. And I have to say, none of them closed. And I am proud as a deputy minister yes. who do who do we didn't do perfectly, of course not, but to do what we've done without losing a job for the Quebecers, without losing a job, without losing a job for the farmers, so they can right. maintain their competitiveness with other. Uh, regions of the world. Uh, th that was very important for me. Amazing. Yeah, that, that is quite an accomplishment, Andre. Yeah. Uh, I, I, again, uh, a couple of things in your answer jump out at me, and that is the uh, the water, uh, the po pollution and what have you. My, yeah. my mother my mother used to tell me that when she was a child, in her in her textbooks at school, when they talked about the industrialization uh, period in the United States, it actually said in her textbooks that how smart the industrialists were to build their factories on rivers so that they could dump the waste into the river. That They thought that was a good thing. Uh, <laughs> a good it, thing, yeah. <laughs> We'd go away. It hurt that. Yeah. yeah. And of course, you know, uh, our last yeah. house in New York was right on the Hudson River. And yeah. by the time I came around, the Hudson River was renewed again, but it took generations okay. to, yes, to renew yes. it be yeah. because of that. Yeah. yeah. And something yeah. that my wife my wife is going to be so excited about in this interview is you mentioned pulp and paper. That's her business. My wife is in the paper business. Yeah. Is that right? Uh, <laughs> and, yeah. And uh, uh, her... Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm th it's not a foundry, but uh, her paper mills are, yeah, are here, yeah. here in the United States. And because of what a paper mill is, Andre, you know better than anybody, you can't build a new paper mill anymore. No, it, no. Environmentally, it's it, it just would not be allowed. Yeah, but, you uh, have to restore one. <laughs> exactly. You have to restore one for sure. So right. interesting. Well, Andre, uh, I'm hoping you'll share some of your experience as a board member of the World Energy Council. And just a little bit of reference for our audience, the World Energy Council is the principal impartial network 
of leaders and practitioners promoting an affordable, stable, and environmentally sensitive energy system for the greatest benefit of all. This position, Andre, had taken you all around the world. So can you share with us uh, how the rest of the world looks at energy? And, and if you would, what countries are leading the charge to an environmentally friendly world? Yes. Okay. Uh, who's leading uh, uh, most of the countries, if you take them by numbers, okay. uh, uh, do work very well hard to bring power to everyone, affordable power to everyone. Right. So this is still the ongoing battle for them. Uh, uh, they have success. Uh, they have success in Africa and in Southeast Asia. Uh, of course, they have success in uh, China because it's the ch situation there has changed completely. So is it right now in India. It's changing very rapidly so that everybody will have access uh, uh, to uh, power at an affordable price, as I said. Uh, right. In India, it, it was not the case during my years, but not only in India. Uh, uh, during my years at WEC, uh, there were a billion people on Earth without any power available. That's mm -hmm. not to say affordable. It was not simply None. available. Uh, was not there. Right. So th 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 this has been uh, corrected. It should encourage us when it comes to us uh, 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 trying to stop uh, 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 world clim climate change. Because we could in the past uh, 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 grow up and stand before very high, very difficult objectives and succeed in changing the situation. I think we will. We will change the situation when it comes to climate change. Of course, you touched on it before, there will be more migration because the desert will enlarge. And uh, the, some of the countries uh, won't be inhabitable anymore. They have to move somewhere else. Mm. which means we will have to accept them as they come because they will have to move. They cannot stay home. There's no home anymore. Uh, uh, or there won't be any, more, any home left. So they have to move either north or south, but they have to move. Mm. Uh, Canada being a very, very large country with a very, very few uh, uh, population, people, many of them, not all, but many of them will try to migrate to Canada. That's for sure, including yeah. Americans, by the way, that do come will come from the south and move, move up north. Uh, that's what's before us. That's what uh, that's part of what they call today adaptation to change. They will have to adapt, and we will have to. Those not directly affected, like us Canadians, will have to accept that others are and have to move up north. And it's not only negative, you know, there's going to be a larger part of a very, very large country that will be inhabitable because it would get warmer. The problem is uh, here that it's too cold and uh, we cannot live uh, up north as you can, you people in the state can live uh, everywhere. It's not the case here. So right. anyway, uh, I think we have to uh, raise to the challenges, uh, and I think we can uh, succeed in doing so, whatever the issue we did with with the uh, power availability. Yeah, we should do it again. So, uh, Andre, you mentioned Africa, Southeast Asia, China, and India, yeah. and, and something I have personal experience with is China. I've been to China now uh, two times yeah. in recent years, and before I went to China, people would tell me, oh my gosh, the pollution, you're going to have trouble breathing, it's a great cloud all the time. I personally did not experience that. And I always say, I don't think they cleaned up the place because Jerry Wagner was coming to visit. Uh, I, <laughs> I, I think, I, I, think uh, I can say that they have made great strides and continue to make strides to uh, be more concerned about the environment in, in all their industrial processes. 
Mm. Yeah, right. The yeah. first time I went to Beijing, you couldn't see at the end of the street. You simply couldn't see. Uh, yeah. But t- today, uh, you can see uh, it's clean like, like they did in Tokyo. In Tokyo, the first time I was there, you couldn't see the mountain. Now you can see it clearly. Interesting. See, we can raise to the challenges. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm. Well, Andre, look, uh, I I don't believe I could end an interview with you without touching on the time of your career that most people know you for, and and that is your time as Chief Executive Officer of Hydro-Quebec and the event of the historic ice storm of 1998. So what fascinates me the most about this is that, you know, similar cases of catastrophic disasters in history, those who were in charge uh, at the time tend not to be looked upon very nicely in, in, in history. In fact, in many cases, the event uh, and how that particular person reacted was the lowest point of their career. And in many cases, quite frankly, it ended their career. But in your case, it was just the opposite. Uh, you are held in the highest regard today because of how you handled uh, that that ice storm in 1998. So please share with us uh, a bit, first of all, history itself of the ice storm and what was going through your mind at the time? How did you uh, put yourself forward to communicate to your customers in the day? Please. In a, in a, well, the ice storm story is simple. In a matter of five days, we've received uh, ten inches of ice on everything. So uh, when it came to the uh, transmission lines and uh, distribution lines, uh, I mean power uh, transmission line, uh, they collapsed. Most of them collapsed. As, yeah. as, uh, it started on a Monday, uh, on Friday. We called it here the Black Friday. There were one line remaining to supply the island, the whole island of uh, half of Quebec's population. Uh, 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 one line. Uh, wow. So there were only power for the hospitals, the fire stations, and people like that that needed, obviously, 100%. And that's all we had. All the others were blacked out. Okay, mm. that's how low we got. Yeah. But there's one thing wonderful that did happen. One absolutely wonderful that, among other things, saved my career. That is, all employees, all Ido Quebec employees, we were looked at uh, a little bit negatively when I got at Ido Quebec, became heroes to the people yeah. when they saw them in the street. So. Right. They change their attitude and they work twice as much as they would have normally worked. They work 14 hours a day, 16 hours a day to make the best we could to reestablish the service to the as many people as possible. So that people felt that because it it did change the nature of things. So sure. they work. They saved my life. It's the empl- the whole employees of Hydro Quebec. They were uh, end of the Canadian Army, by the way. We had twenty four thousand people on in the field in the region. Wow. Uh, half from the army, the other half from Hydro Quebec. They worked uh, very hard. Uh, 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 as I said, twice as much as they would uh, normally. They saved uh, my career, and not only that, of course, more and much more important, they saved lives. Sure. Because in Canada, uh, no, with no power, when you have uh, uh, converted people from whatever source of, ele- of power to electricity, and electricity breaks down, well, it's still winter. And right. I, was afraid, but I remember I was afraid. When it's during the ice storm, it's not in a very uh, 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 very risky situation because ice storms do happen when it's minus one, minus two degrees. But right. it can get minus 30, minus 40 immediately after and after with no power 
uh, uh, with no power system, then we would have been in real uh, trouble. But right. God help us. He waited a while before he, the, the, the coal came back. And yeah. by, by the way, maybe you would be interested. I usually say that when I talk about the storm. On Friday at noon, when there was only one line left, uh, 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 I raised from my chair, went to the, uh, to the window and said, oh, the mighty God, uh, we had enough. We did everything we could. Has to stop now. We cannot live with much more than that. And uh, we're tired. And right. uh, the system is tired. It's going to collapse. Everything is going to collapse. Yeah. And uh, won't be able to supply the hospital and so on. Half hour after, the rain stopped. And there we go. D -d divine intervention. <laughs> A little divine intervention never, help, never hurts. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Wow, that's the uh, Andre. Let me ask you: am, am I wrong? It's always been my understanding that a lot of the electricity for New York City comes from Quebec. Is that correct? Yes, yes, that's so, correct. Yeah. So, so what effect did the ice storm of '98 have on the United States, if any? Not much, because the the power was available. It was not available in Montreal. Oh. So it could go to the intersection and we could easily supply uh, uh, New York. By the way, it's 25% at any point in the system because otherwise it would uh, be called uh, manipulation. Uh, uh, there would be a risk of manip price manipulation. So it's not accepted, of course not. Uh, in, in the state would not be either here. So at any point of the system, there's always less than 25%. And I was looking at that myself because otherwise we would have been in charge, of course, of, of trying to uh, exercise a, a monopoly over the power in uh, New England or New York. Or uh -huh. whatever. Interesting. Uh -huh. Interesting. So there are rules. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, well, Andre, look, uh, 26 years have passed. Can you believe it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 20, 26 20, years have passed. And I wonder if time has changed your perspective on the event. Uh, are utilities, uh, both local and federal governments, are they better prepared nowadays for such an event if it were to happen? Tell yes. us. I, I think they are. Uh, 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 because uh, the system has not been built the way it was before. It's been right. built much stronger. So if the same thing would happen today, instead of a month without power, it would be a week only. Okay. okay? So that's the right. first change. Second, people are much more prepared. And uh, thank God, because it may be not to the same extent, but there are uh, crises do appear very often, either, either wind or uh, ice storm, by the way, we still have ice storm, of course. And sure. uh, I look back, uh, my successor have to face situation where they lose, uh, we call it, we lose, we use the word lose uh, customers, that, which <laughs> means they don't have power anymore. Right. And uh, it takes time to reestablish uh, the situation, of course, and so on. So it's not, it's not easy, we have, but we've learned. At least we learn how to uh, 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 get ready. You know, it's important to react right. fast to when this happens. So you don't have weeks to prepare. You, uh, you, you must be active uh, the hour, the next hour. You have to be there fighting. You know, so sure. they are. Yeah, they are. Well, that's good news. That that's good yeah. to hear, Andre. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, Andre, as we come to the end of our time together, uh, please share with our audience what you're doing today. Where are your interests? Where are you putting your energies? Uh, what What are you up to today? I I work. I still work. Okay. And I'm proud. Doing what? Tell I us. Can't, what can't, I can't imagine myself uh, without working. Well, I work with uh, two companies, with three companies, basically. One is uh, trying to implement here in Quebec to produce lithium hydroxide. It's uh, in the in lithium hydroxide being used in the building of lithium ion batteries. Okay, so okay. that's that's one. Uh, uh, and the other two are two uh, family 
companies. They are owned by families. Uh, 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 they now are uh, above 250 million in uh, market. Uh, so it's, uh, they have at least double since I work with uh, uh, with them. I'm proud of that. I'm not the only one, by the way. We are six or eight on the board mm. of each of each of one. One is the uh, in waste management, and the other one is in plastic uh, uh, plastic uh, manufacturing. And uh, right. both of them are active abroad. The one is in Chile and Peru. The other one is in uh, the states, heavily in the states. Uh, uh, and uh, I like to I work for family. So the, there's one of the successor that is the president. The others are the vice presidents, and I work with them to develop uh, sound management for their company. It's going well. I'm proud of that. I like to work. I decided I would become a specialist of uh, managing a family-owned company to make it grow. And uh, the object, the, uh, the ultimate objective, of course, is getting on the market, yeah. on the public market. So that's what I do. I've been doing that now for many years. It's been, uh, it's been what twenty years since I've been doing that for these two, especially. I like I like it very much. That makes that gives me uh, something to think of, uh, some some people to talk when I have an idea, and uh, to, to some some people to talk to. That's what I do. Yeah, no, it's beautiful. I hope right? I don't disturb them too much. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you know just the. Yeah, more available than and, 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 <laughs> and and I love your feeling about a family-owned business. Uh, I think you yeah. know who I work for, so I like a family-owned yeah. business as well. Very, <laughs> exactly. very, very, very exactly. much so. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, look, look, Andre. One last thing, if you'll allow me. Uh, yeah. At the end of every program, uh, you'll see when this goes to air that I I do something called Jerry's Pick of the Month, where I just share with our audience something that I have found. In the last 30 days, it could be a book, a movie, a documentary, a tool. It's oftentimes, it has nothing to do with HVAC, our business. Uh, but it's just something that I found that I'd like to share with our audience. And I've been offering our guests the same opportunity. So to that end, is there something that you would like to share with our audience, Andre, that has just been a, a super turn on for you recently? Maybe it's a, a book or something. Please, there's a, is there anything you'd like to share? Yes, I've got... Uh... Uh, have confidence in your doctor. They can cure you of just about anything these days. Okay. Okay. That's my own experience, of course. <laughs> and, and, well, uh, we have something in common, uh, Andre. I had a massive heart attack six months ago, and yeah. I would not be here talking to you if it were not for the technology uh, available mm. nowadays, for the uh, immediate assistance that I got. Um, so yeah, I, I can absolutely appreciate w w your, your comment there about doctors. Uh, you know, yeah. often in my case, I had no choice, right? I was literally, uh, moments away from dying. Uh, but you're just lucky that the tech 20 years ago, uh, a stent didn't yeah. exist and I wouldn't be here. So, uh, we are, we are lucky the times that we are born into oftentimes it's just a, a, a roll of the dice, but, uh, um, okay. Yeah. Yeah, you so don't look sick at all. I can tell you that in my well, name. Well, in name of all your you. audience, <laughs> everybody. <laughs> well, I give all the credit to in my your audience. <laughs> yeah. I, I give all the credit to my wife, Andre. She's helped me yeah. get my health good. back. And uh, yeah, yeah, very well, good. Look, Andre, I, I cannot thank you enough for sharing your valuable time with us, your incredible thoughts, and your experiences mm. in your career and your life. It has been one of the honors of my career to have this uh, conversation with you. So, Andre, thank you so much. And I hope we get to do it You're again welcome. sometime. Yes, yes, I hope so. Thank you, sir. Bye-bye. 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 Bye-bye, everyone. Good luck. Bye-bye, Andre. Bye. Well, okay, everybody. It's time for Jerry's Pick of the Month. And I guess I'm on a roll with documentaries. Patricia and I love documentaries. Uh, and uh, we've just caught a couple of really great ones lately. Uh, and the one that I'm going to recommend uh, this month is on CNN. And it's a rarity that I would ever recommend anything on CNN. But uh, nonetheless, <laughs> this is a CNN documentary called Space Shuttle Columbia, 
the final flight. And it is the story of the ill-fated uh, space shuttle Columbia, which uh, broke up in re-entry into the Earth's orbit and uh, losing, we lost the, the entire uh, space shuttle crew. Um, you know, it's one of those subjects that, uh, you know, first of all, wasn't all that long ago. It's modern history. Uh, I thought I knew everything there was to know about it. It certainly had been well documented at the time. Uh, but when you watch this uh, documentary, you realize uh, how much you didn't know. And I think the difference with this doc is that it involves intimately the families of the lost space shuttle crew. Uh, and it's just incredibly dramatic. Uh, there is also an element of it that is uh, a, a bit of a whistleblower tale, uh, there are people who are uh, who were employees of NASA at the time that recognized the potential for a disaster on reentry, and um, their concerns were, I don't want to say ignored, but certainly discounted, I think would be an accurate description. But uh, definitely worth checking out. You do got to put some time into it. It's four episodes, an hour an episode, so, you know, there is a four-hour commitment but uh, well, well worth the time. I think you'll find it super interesting. So once again, it's a CNN original series, Space Shuttle Columbia, The Final Flight. Well, guys, uh, thanks for tuning in again. This was just an incredible episode with Andre Kali. Uh, I just feel so honored, so fortunate, so blessed to have had the opportunity to spend that time with Andre. And uh, next month, we're going to have another exciting uh, ho uh, guest, and that is Mr. Travis Stever, who is the co-lead guitar player for Coheed and Cambria. I'm so excited about uh, getting that uh, premiered um, in about a month. So keep an eye out for that as well. So thanks, everybody. See you soon. Thanks for listening. Bye-bye.